You're listening to Lucid Cafe. I'm your host, Wendy Halley. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Lucid Cafe. I swear, the time thing has gotten worse since the last episode, if that's even possible. (laughs) It's like I'm arm wrestling with my schedule and calendars and clocks, and guess who's winning? That's right, not me. (laughs) I'm, I'm trying to make friends with time, but nope, time's like, keep up, human. So that's that story. Enough of that nonsense. Today's episode is another really good one. We go into territory that I not only love, but I believe is vitally important and is where true magic lives, our dreams. Our dreaming is such rich territory and is something that we in the Western world have gotten really far away from. And since we're on the topic, did you know that you can learn how to dream while you're awake? I don't mean daydreaming, which is the territory of imagination. Or psychosis, I mean have actual dreams that you interact with in a waking state. It's something we all know how to do. I mean, you did it naturally when you were a kid, but most of us, myself included, have forgotten how to do it or have written it off as bullshit. My life changed pretty dramatically when I learned how to intentionally have waking dreams. Now it's a regular part of my personal life and my work life. Because it's such a powerful, and as you'll learn in this episode, ancient practice, I created a workbook called The Magical Path that teaches you how to reconnect with your ability to have waking dreams. It comes with two audio tracks to help you safely and easily enter a waking dream state. The Magical Path workbook is available on Amazon and at the shop on my website, lucidpathwellness.com. I'll throw some links in the show notes if you'd like to check it out. All right, so my guest, Dr. Edward Tick, is a nonfiction writer and poet. He is a transformational healer, holistic psychotherapist, educator, consultant, and international journey guide. Edward has been working to heal the invisible wounds of war and violent trauma for over 40 years. He's honored for his groundbreaking work in the spiritual, holistic, and community-based healing of veterans, and other survivors of severe violence who suffer post-traumatic stress disorder and moral injury. In this episode, I talk with Ed about his lifelong dedication to working with veterans and his latest book, Soul Medicine, Healing Through Dreams, Visions, Oracles, and Pilgrimage, which is an in-depth exploration of the ancient Greek healing traditions. Oh, and just a quick note, so you don't get too confused. Ed makes several references to the healing chamber I have here at Lucid Path Wellness, which I do end up describing later in our conversation. So if you hang in there, (laughs) eventually you'll know what the hell we're talking about. So please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Edward Tick. Well, Ed, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. I'm honored to be with you. Thank you for having me. When I got the invitation to talk to you, I was pretty excited because we seem to have a lot of overlap in the work that we do. Uh, You have a a newish book out called Soul Medicine, Healing Through Dream Incubation, Visions, Oracles, and Pilgrimage. It's a pretty hefty book. You cover a lot of ground in it. Before we get into the content of the book, I'd love to hear how you found yourself on this path? Because my understanding is you're a psychotherapist and the book really dives into your connection with ancient Greek practices and philosophy. So how did you find yourself there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll try to give a condensed answer to a very complicated life journey. So my first answer for how I found myself there is that I did have a big dream and a vision when I was very young, four and six years old. And so 
It wasn't in particular about Greece, but it, they were definitely breakthrough spiritual dreams, experiences that set me on the spiritual path very early in life and separated me from the common and the mainstream and also taught me how different we are and that most people don't know about these things and can't talk about them. So, uh, so I was initiated into the, the dream and vision world at a very young age before I even had the language for it. So that was four and six. Then I'm flashing forward to my 10th birthday. Uh, I grew up in New York City, and at age 10, we were able to get our adult library cards. So on my 10th birthday, after, as soon as school closed, I ran to uh, our regional, our na neighborhood library, got my card, and joyously went into the adult section for the, I, I'd been there before, but to take out my first adult book and bring it home. And really, I didn't know what to take. I was wandering between the floor to ceiling stacks. And I don't know how it happened, but a book either fell or was pushed off a top shelf and fell into my hands. And it was the Iliad. Just some light reading for a 10 year old. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I said to the book, I don't know how you got here or who pushed you into my hands, but you look really fascinating. We're going home together. So really, at 10 years old, I devoured the Iliad and fell in love with the Greek tradition, mythology, and its history and culture, uh, and really everything about it. And so from 10 years old on, I've been immersing myself in this tradition. So that's my personal beginning. My wife and I went to Greece uh, in 1984. That was my first trip there. We were discussing our marriage plans, and she just said, so have you thought about? And that was it. And I knew the rest of the question was where we might like to go on our honeymoon. Before she got another word out, I just blurted, Greece. <laughs> and she thought, oh, wonderful. Beautiful islands and beaches and sunshine and great food. Okay. She didn't know, but she learned quickly that we were going on a serious spiritual journey. So we did in 1984. I went back myself in 1987, and this catches us up to the healing work. I have been specializing in, as a psychotherapist, I've been specializing in working with uh, war and violent trauma survivors my entire career. And I got into that separately from the Greek tradition because I turned 18 in 1969. I was protesting the Vietnam War in college. Blessedly, I didn't have to go. I got a high lottery number but I still wanted to give some form of service. I believe in universal service, but not necessarily in the military. Peacemaking, healing service, educational service. So having been a war protester, I still felt like I wanted to give some form of alternative service. I became, a, I finished, ah, in your neighborhood. I got my master's degree in psychology from Goddard College. No way. Next door to you. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I was in a conventional uh, master's program in counseling, and it was Mickey Mouse. It was so easy. So I went to Goddard to really go deep and really dive into the depths of psychology, and Goddard encourages that, as you know. Yes, they do. So I got my mes master's from Goddard in psychology in 75, and very shortly after that, I began practicing therapy in New York State in a rural area, and Vietnam veterans started to come into my practice. This was year, uh, several years before post-traumatic stress disorder was even recognized as an issue. In 19, that was 1980. So I began working with vets about 1977, really uh, very shortly after the war ended. And I saw it immediately as a form of alternative service I could give. I didn't want to go to that. I wouldn't go to that war. I was protesting it. I had determined that if I was drafted and had to go and couldn't get out in any other way, the only way I could go would be as a medic. And it's in my family legacy. My godfather, my uncle, was a medic at the Battle of the Bulge and had severe PTSD his whole life. Wow. So I also inherited it. And I, though nobody had spoke, talked about it, I saw it and I grew up around it. So I began working with our Vietnam veterans in the mid to late 1970s. And for about 
Well, eight or ten years, I gave the best possible therapy that I knew how to give. I read and studied everything about war trauma. There was almost no literature in the psychology field about it at all. I'm drenched in the humanities and affirm that we who are in the healing uh, professions and arts really should be drenched in the humanities and the arts and spiritual traditions because that's what our patients need and that's what's surfacing in them. And psychology and medicine make terrible, terrible mistakes and misinterpretation and mistreatment. So I knew all that. I had all that. I determined to go back to Greece in the mid-1980s in order to research the citizen warrior tradition of ancient Greece and see how did they deal with war trauma and how did they bring their warriors home. Since then and there, everybody served. And they served for their entire adult life. It was from age 18 to age 60. Everybody was in either like Spartans permanently in the military all the time or like the Athenians, basically in the National Guard. When there is a need, you're called up and you serve at your own expense all the way up to age 60. So I knew this and I knew much about the, the Greek warrior tradition from the studies, but I began traveling there in 1987 to really immerse myself in it learn and study the traditions and the rituals and see if I could use them to bring help bring our warriors home. So, in 1980, it's a long story, but this is how I became immersed. In 1987, I went back for a solo research trip on the Greek warrior tradition and very, very many spiritual breakthroughs happened on that trip, but I just want to mention one for now. We'll see if we get to others. Uh, I went to uh, Epidavros, Epidaurus, it's spelled Epidaurus in, in English, which was the principal healing sanctuary of ancient Greece. The god of healing in ancient Greece was Asclepius, and he healed by bringing what Jung would call big dreams. People went into deep incubation, withdrawal into the retreat centers, receiving holistic healing um, that is beyond the scope of even what our holistic centers offer. Some of us, like you, are trying to bring it back. Thank you. Um, but it was really profound, comprehensive, holistic uh, healing centers. I didn't know that at the time. I went in 1987 because there's a wonderful, giant, ancient theater there that is still used in the summer to, uh, for um, uh, ancient theater festival. I went to see the Trojan Women by Euripides, which is one of the greatest anti-war plays the world has. Euripides was a general in the Athenian army, and he wrote this play to protest uh, the atrocities that Athens had been committing during the Peloponnesian War. This play shows all of the war wounding that everybody experiences. There's no war scenes. It's about the fall of Troy. The Greeks have conquered it. And we see the city burning and all the women being carried off into slavery. The children are being murdered and the men are all dead from the war. So we see in the most profound poetry and language and Greek theater, which, as you know, contains all of the moving and acting arts, we experience the pain of war trauma to its depths. I went there in 1987, and I was transformed by one night of theater. I went into the theater thinking of myself as a therapist for Vietnam veterans. That's what I had been doing for about a decade at the time. That th play was so intense, and it penetrated me to my depths. And it awakened me to the awareness that all wars are essentially the same. War itself is an archetype. It has a, a spiritual energy and life of its own. It keeps visiting humanity. Silly humanity doesn't, we don't learn from our mistakes and we keep replicating it rather than stopping it. Yes. But war is always the same, all times and all places. The uniforms change. The political and economic reasons for the war change, but the essential experience of killing or being killed, of feeling oneself taken over by universal and berserker energies, 
of losing our consciousness, of having our morality completely shattered, and of losing our souls, but also sometimes discovering our souls and discovering spirituality within that very severe traumatic condition always happens in wars. And the plays show it, and I awaken to all of that. So I actually left the theater saying, I'm not a therapist for Vietnam veterans. I'm called to be a war healer and apply what I'm learning to all wars and violent trauma, all times and all places. And then I also said, why is this great theater and why are these plays performed in an ancient healing sanctuary? So from that moment on, I began studying and investigating the Asclepian tradition the use of the sacred theater as a healing tool within that tradition, but the holistic tradition, and especially how uh, in that tradition healing dreams and visions were facilitated and how to do that practice, uh, how it was done in ancient times and how to do it in modern times. So from then on, uh, I began studying it, and then, let's see, that was 87. So in 1995, I led my first Asclepian Dream Healing Pilgrimage to Greece, and I used the practice then with extraordinary uh, power and results and really deep healing for the, the supplicants that came along, and so I've been doing it ever since. And so um, I had an earlier book called The Practice of Dream Healing that came out in 2001, about my first five years in this tradition, and now my book Soul Medicine catches up the last 20 years in this tradition that I've been practicing. And it includes Asclepian dream healing practices, but as you mentioned from the subtitle, is rather long. Dream incubation is the dream healing practice. Also, seeking visions and oracles and being on pilgrimage, immersing in another spiritually based culture and uh, seeking and experiencing synchronistic events. So on my journeys and in my practice, uh, and you do much of this too, I use dream incubation for not everyday ordinary dreams, but for big tr life transforming dreams. And we go to oracular sites um, to seek and receive oracles. Sometimes that happens spontaneously as well. Uh, we seek visions, uh, waking visions from spiritual sources. And we're on pilgrimage, deeply immersing in this culture that is archetypal. And we both know this too. The myths are or mythology, the mythological figures are archetypes that live in all of us. So people also identify the archetypes that are living in them. And they reinterpret their wounds and their diagnoses in mythological, archetypal, psycho-spiritual terms. So, for example, I'm not a sex addict. I've got a troubled relationship with the goddess Aphrodite. I'm not a drunk and alcoholic. I have a messed up relationship with the god Dionysus and I need I can put it right and heal uh, the way I'm abusing these sacred dimensions and restore the sacred and heal myself through mythic immersion and healing. So that's my long answer to your short question that <laughs> takes us from f four years old to today, 71 years old, I'm leaving for Greece literally tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so we'll try to make this conversation quick so you can sure. pack. <laughs> no, I've been packing so we would be free. Thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> holy shit, Ed. All right, so that's quite an introduction. I mean, you covered a lot of ground right there, and I'm like, oh, I want to dive into that, I want to dive into that, I want to dive into that. So I'm going to do my best to see what ground we can cover in our conversation. But one of the overarching questions I have for you is contemporary population's relationship with the dreaming. What is your take on that? To me, it seems like such a remote oh. relationship that we don't really have a relationship with our dreaming selves and the content of our dreams, really. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yes, and thank you for that question. It's really important. All right, first, let's affirm that dreaming and being in dream time, sharing the dreams, reenacting the dreams in waking life in your community or tribe are ancient, ancient practices. Not only the Greek tradition, but 
uh, there throughout the the Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, there are dreams and visions, and we're told that this is how the divine communicates with human beings. Uh, in indigenous cultures around the world, dreams are very, very important. We know the Aborigine people call the real time dream time. And here in our mortal coil, well, we're just in the fallen physical condition, not living in this spiritual space. And many cultures, uh, the very first thing people do in the morning is uh, they gather around the, the, the family fire or the council fire and they share their dreams. And they talk about their dreams. And they wonder which dreams came for you, the individual, and which ones are for all of us collectively. So the wisdom of dreams has been recognized and utilized for tens of thousands of years in traditional cultures. That being said, we have, you're right, we have lost uh, our connection to dreaming and the importance of it. It's been disappearing uh, really for 2,000 years since we became, um, and the turn occurred in ancient Greece as well, where Greece was primarily spiritual for thousands of years and then in the so-called Greek Enlightenment, the era of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Hippocrates, scientific medicine, transformed from sacred medicine into scientific medicine and splitting the scientific and the sacred. So the split in Western, oh, first of all, medicine and psychology in the Western world as we know them originated and grew out of the Asclepian dream healing tradition. So this, these are our roots. And this, these are the roots of the profession of psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy in Western civilization. So we need, or we always need to get back to our roots and make sure they're strong and healthy and restore them. That being said, since that era of the Greek Enlightenment, when mostly Aristotle and Hippocrates split medicine from spirituality and split medicine from philosophy. Until then, it was a branch of philosophy. It was a way to tend the soul as it expressed itself through the body. And Hippocrates even said that. He said, all illness begins in the soul and finally ends up in the body. But since that time, medicine has been treating the body and ignoring the soul and ignoring the way our symptoms arise from the soul and our messages from the soul. So I'm returning to that tradition to read our symptoms, not as symptoms to be erased, which is what medicine does, but as symbols telling us what's going on in our inner life. And all that being said, really for thousands of years, dreams have lost in our civilization, dreams have lost their importance and their primacy, so much so that m many people don't even take them seriously. Even modern science and scientific psychology, many people say, they're nonsense. They're garbage recirculating from the, our everyday life. They don't really have meaning. And that's nonsense. They have such deep and profound meaning. We've even lost the ability to, as the humanities and the arts are being suppressed in modern culture, we lose the, our richness and our cachet of symbols. So we don't even know how to interpret symbols anymore. Right. So we've become nearly, we've lost our fluency. We don't know how, even how to talk about this stuff, and it absolutely needs to be restored. So I'm working on that. And then even with Freud and Jung, Freud did restore the importance of dreams. Interpretation of Dreams was published in um, 1900, to begin the 20th century. So he did restore the importance of dreams in psychological thinking and somewhat in uh, use in medicine, but only in a, a limited way with the personal unconscious and with Freud's psychosexual theories. Right. Jung happily took dreams very seriously, understood their archetypal content, gave us fantastic uh, understanding and theory and practice for how to use and interpret dreams, taught us the difference between what he called little dreams and big dreams, the Little dreams are the everyday lives or the personal dreams you have. And the big dreams are the archetypal dreams where we have breakthroughs to the spirit world. And he also taught that what heals us is that connection to the spiritual, to the numinous. And we don't want to diagnose. 
We don't want to reduce. We don't want to pathologize. We want to use dreams and even our symptoms as symbols to open ourselves to the archetypal world and restore our spiritual connections and use them as access to the inner world. So my work is very, very much in that tradition, working to restore the primacy of dreams to our daily lives, of our awake lives, and to our healing efforts. And to end this part, I wake up earlier than my wife, and I always have her coffee ready for her when she wakes up. And when she shows up, the very first thing I say is, Good morning, my love. Did you have any dreams last night? Let's sit down and tell me about them. So we make dreaming at least a, restore that primal connection to dreaming in our personal lives as well as in my healing work. That's beautiful. Again, you covered a lot of ground. It sounds like when the science of medicine kicked in into the collective, well, that materialistic perspective, there was no room for a soul, right? The, the idea of a soul. Right. Well, I guess it, it doesn't exist from that perspective. It's, um, it's the realm of maybe more magical thinking or religion. Right. And medicine and psychology and science have in large part banished, even banished the concept of soul. So even our words for psychology come from the Asclepian dream healing tradition, and we don't know it. So psychology, we all learn, means the study of the mind. No, these are ancient Greek words. Psyche means soul, not mind in Greek. And logos, logi, does not mean to study. Logi is the beautiful, untranslatable word logos. Logos means something like the order and meaning of the cosmos. So psychology is not the study of the mind as it has been reduced to. And since the 1800s, psychologists been, have been trying to prove they're really scientists. Not artists as well as scientists or not uh, humanistic scientists or artistic. And they don't put science and spirit together, but rather we've reduced human be behavior to empirical studies that have to be evidence-based that say, right, there's no such thing as the invisible. We have to be empirical, rational, positivistic, and only see and talk about it and, and measure what we can count and what we can see. And we even wipe out the primacy of experience. You and I and anybody in a psycho-spiritual field would affirm that Experience is evidence. You want empirical evidence? Well, this person healed in this way. And even psychology and medicine have even banished case studies. Freud and Jung wrote entire books on one person to show the profound complexity of the inner world. That's wonderful. I love doing case studies. James Hillman, who is in this tradition, said, we shouldn't be taking case studies. We should be taking soul histories. We should explore soul histories together. So we need to depathologize and restore the spiritual and the archetypal dimensions. Psychology. Psychotherapy comes from this tradition. Psyche is soul. Therapeia is a servant or an, an attendant. So a psychotherapist would literally be a servant of the soul. And yatros is doctor. So a psychiatrist is a psychiatros, a soul doctor not a medication dispenser, as most of them have unfortunately become in modern times. So all of this is about restoring soul that your right has nearly disappeared as a modern concept. Even in one of my books called War on the Soul, after I had written the manuscript, I was asked, you're talking about the soul? Well, people don't even know what that is anymore. Way, go back to your first chapter and you've got to explain to readers, what do we mean by the soul? We don't even know that in modern terms. So, yes, you're right. We've lost this. And that's part of our profound spiritual wounding and alienation. And all of the healing work I'm devoted to and you're devoted to are to restore the spiritual dimensions and reawaken people to the reality of their souls. And how would you define the soul? The droplet of the divine that's planted in each of us. Uh, we could extemporate on that, but that's enough. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's, I just, I think because so many of us are disconnected from the concept, I think it's important to maybe get someone who's doing soul level work, their perspective on what it actually is. 
Well, then let me add a little more from the Greek tradition that I use and rely on in my teachings and my pilgrimage over there. Look, so we affirm that soul is an ancient Greek word, psyche, psyche. And by the way, in ancient times, uh, the soul was also, by some of the wise ancient ones, uh, portrayed as like a spiritual butterfly inside us that gives us our animation, gives uh, our matter its life, and then is released when our bodies pass. So psyche in ancient Greek meant both soul and butterfly. And that's beautiful. And that was the first vision I had when I was four years old of a spiritual butterfly. Okay. So I was initiated then before I even had these words. So the Greek tradition gave us the soul, but people, until Socrates' time, people thought it was kind of a vague, ethereal concept, something like our ghost or our, our shades, like the shades that go down into the underworld and are just kind of after images of the life. Socrates was the first one who taught that, in the Western tradition anyway, that the soul is the center of our being, the soul is what gives us our consciousness, and in particular, the soul gives us our moral order. It teaches us what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong. And the soul, in Socrates' teaching, is deepened and improved by doing good and right, and harmed, weakened, damaged when we do wrong. So we now, for the last 10 years or so, have the concept of moral injury in modern psychology. And of course, working with veterans, we, I used to work with that concept a lot. Uh, our modern psychologists don't even attribute it to where it came from, from um, the, our, the early spiritual eras of Western civilization. But in fact, Socrates taught us what moral injury is. You do good for your soul and other people's souls when you do good in the world and you harm your own soul and you're morally injured and you deteriorate and become a, a shitty person when you harm others or harm the earth. And that's moral injury. And that's what he taught us. And he also taught that we absolutely must live by truth. And so he was devoted to telling the truth and helping people reveal the truth. And there too, we are aligned with our souls when we're living in truth and we're betraying our souls and we're betraying the collective when we lie, when we don't live in truth as tragically our culture is torn to shreds by this. Right. Uh, but so the soul, so the soul is the drop of the divine that gives us self-awareness and teaches us to distinguish between good and evil, right and wrong, and tries to guide us toward the good, the true, and the beautiful, so that we live meaningful and enriching lives for ourselves and for each other. Yes. I was just thinking that even our relationship with the truth is convoluted these days. I, I won't get on my soapbox about that, but I did want to share that the shamanic tradition that I uh, studied is Hawaiian or Polynesian, and they have the belief that we have three souls. And one of the souls is the one that I think you're referring to, which we would call the Almakua, the oversoul, the higher self. It's the part of us that dreams our physical self into existence. And then we have a mental soul called the Lono, which is our ego, basically. And the, the Hawaiians would say we grow a new mental soul each lifetime. And then we have a body soul, which is is our unconscious selves. It's our It's the part of us that runs and repairs and restores our bodies and it's the storehouse of our memories and the part of us that learns and creates habits and is the source of our emotions and feelings. So their concept is that the ideal human is one who's in relationship with all three souls. Like all three souls are working together as a team rather than independently mm -hmm. each achieving their own goals. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, I have chills right now up and down my spine because not only have I heard that concept, but it's nearly identical to the Greek concept of the soul. And it's also in relation to other uh, concepts of soul from other spiritually based traditions. So the Greek, uh, ancient Greek teachings about the soul are almost identical. They also teach that there are three souls or three parts of the soul. The lower, the animal soul. And 
the middle, the mid is not the ego, it's the heart. And then the upper is the, the higher self, which is both our, our reason and our connection to the cosmos. And they just, as in the Polynesian tradition, they teach that if any one of these dominate, we are out of balance. We're usually cut off from the higher self and the body takes over. And when the heart and the, bo and the body are united, but the higher self is cut off, that is the most powerful condition that's nearly irresistible. And I use this a lot with, uh, in my war healing work with veterans. Their emotions and their guts have been really connected and become almost fused in the combat experience, and they're cut off from the higher self. Mm. And the Greek tradition teaches, as the Polynesian, that they all have to be united, and that if the two lower ones are united with the upper one being cut off, we're powerless against the animal in us. But when we join the higher self to the other souls, that's when we can gain mastery and control and become fully integrated. So the teaching is almost identical. I also work in Vietnam and, you know, and leech pilgrimage there. The Vietnamese teach that, this is so interesting too, the, the similarities in healing traditions. The Vietnamese teach that we have seven souls. Basically, it's the same as the chakras, that each chakra in the Vietnamese tradition is a soul and that they be, can become lost and separated and different illnesses, psychological or physical illnesses, are one or more of those souls being wounded or lost. And that uh, in the countryside, healing is somebody's ill. So all the people in the village come to their house and they get up on the, the roof and they call the souls back through ritual and ceremony. When I take veterans to Vietnam, we've been to places where they experience combat and experience soul loss. And we stand on that site and we call their souls back. Mm. And scouts on our miracles have happened. I have a memory right now of standing at a very remote battlefield in Dok Tho in the northwestern countryside where one of our men was an officer in a terrible battle and that's where he lost his soul. We stood, we found a foxhole that he had actually served in and we stood at that foxhole which was the front line and our whole group, Americans and Vietnamese together, faced the mountain where he faced the battle and we cried out for Terry's soul to return and at that second it was a beautiful sunny warm dry day at that second lightning hit the top of the mountain opposite Ooh. us fierce strikes of lightning and Terry just went from from screaming in anguish to being flooded with tears collapsing next to the foxhole and he had an intense catharsis, crying out 45 years of old pain and horror that had happened on that battlefield that he had held in since then, and completely cleansed himself uh, so that from that moment on, he was a different person. And he came home, he finished his master's degree, he became a teacher for other veterans, he spent the rest of his life also reconciling with the Vietnamese people and putting our countries together. So this stuff really works. Holy Not only shit. in ancient yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a great example. <laughs> Very powerful example. It is interesting how if you start going back far enough in time and looking at these wisdom traditions, how much similarities they have. It's yes. pretty astounding if you think about it. And maybe not. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's just that somehow because of their practices, they were able to tap into this stuff so much more easily than we are now. We've lost that ability. It seems a little bit more monumental to be able to do it now. It seems so foreign. Well, it is. That's why I practice immersion, cultural immersion. Uh, so uh, I've led, by now I've led, well, I leave tomorrow to lead my 23rd pilgrimage in Greece. And I've led 19 in Vietnam. So I've really spent much of my adult career uh, practicing cultural and spiritual immersion in, in other cultures and on our continent as well. I, I immerse and I'm initiated uh, in Native American cultures. And what we can share is 
Yes, we've become terribly, terribly isolated and alienated. Our rationality, our empiricism, our materialism, our individuality, instead of a, a, being a collective culture, we're all broken from, we're broken from each other instead of integrated as uh, whole beings. All of these cause hideous degrees of isolation, alienation, depression, despair. I do see how hungry people are, and our professions show it too. Some of your practices are to bring people deeply into their souls again. Uh, and look at the hunger people have for psychedelics and ketamine therapy, which is yep. returning fiercely now. The good news is that it's returning fiercely and that people want these tools for spiritual healing and growth. The bad news is the medical system is taking it over and controlling it and going to prescribe and pathologize it. And it needs shamans to direct the healing, not people from the medical world who are cut off from their spirituality. But that, that does indicate how hungry for holistic and spiritual experience people are, S desperately starving for it. And people don't know, but you and I do know and practice that there are many ways to facilitate spiritual experience. So we can facilitate dreams, big dreams, spiritual dreams, and we can seek and receive oracles, and we can go on vision quests, and we can incubate as people do in your chambers, to go deep inside without relying on the chemical to get us there, but doing it through our holistic uh, and psycho-spiritual practices alone or together or in a healing center like yours or immersing in uh, cultures that still have these living traditions. So I, my journeys overseas are between 10 days and three weeks. And I always, always see people clinging to our conventional values and ways of doing things for the first five to seven days. Uh, as they're being deconditioned and learning to live communally and cooperatively and pay attention to their dreams and drench in the artistic traditions of the other cultures. So the images are awakening. Like Jung said, we got to, the, the archetypes have been become dried up in us. We have to water the archetypes. So go to museums, read poetry, study artwork, water your <laughs> archetypes in every way possible. So people start to spontaneously change after five, six, seven days in this. And by day 10, they are really pretty deconditioned, deprogrammed from our way of life and dreaming deeply every night. We have dream groups every day, sharing the dreams, having extraordinarily important insights and reinterpreting their life stories, including their illnesses, diseases, uh, challenges in psycho spiritual or mythological terms mm. and transforming the way they even think about themselves and carry themselves. So I see people doing really five or 10 years of intensive growth and healing work in the 10 days or two weeks that we're immersing in these traditions. It's miraculous and beautiful. It sounds incredibly powerful. For those of us who can't go on a pilgrimage, can you recommend a simple technique that maybe just a listener, like a little tease of your book that a, a listener sure. could take away from our conversation and play around with? Yes, absolutely. So I even sometimes facilitate incubations at home and even by Zoom. And even during the pandemic, I've done some workshops on this tradition. So people can seek big dreams themselves, for sure. The name of the building that was reserved for nothing but dream seeking, dream vision questing, which the Greeks called dream incubation, the name of the building was the Abaton, Avaton, which meant the place never be to be trespassed. Only the most sacred seeking of divine vision of uh, dreams and visions through this practice were done in the Avaton. And your chamber is an Avaton. It's reserved for only for spiritual seeking and healing. Ah, okay. 
Anybody can set up their bedroom or another room in their home as an avatar. And really kind of easily. Uh, the Native American vision quest is a good analogy to this practice. They also, of course, take dreams and visions very seriously. And at particular times in their life, uh, going off to war, going uh, through, through the uh, adolescent rites of passage to become a young adult, uh, before marriage, before when one is particularly afflicted, when one needs spiritual connection, they go out off into the wilderness from one to four days, uh, their tribe supports them, their, uh, their medicine people train and prepare them, and then they're on a mountaintop or in the desert or in a cave for four days alone, praying and fasting and just waiting and watching for a dream or vision to come or an extraordinary natural event to come to them. Dream incubation in the Greek tradition is the same way, except it was done either in caves earlier on or in the abaton in dream healing sanctuaries that were holistic healing centers in the classical era. And we know that there were more than 320 of them all over the Mediterranean world, actually from Egypt to the Iberian Peninsula and North, Northern Africa all the way up into the Caucasus. It wasn't only Greece. So it was quite extensive and thousands and thousands of people use them. And we have records of th about a thousand cures uh, and healings that had happened in that tradition. People can do this simply on their own, just using the model. So to any of our friends out there listening, you can declare yourself on a dream quest. You can decide to incubate yourself. You can read and study and practice uh, about this tradition. Journal a lot about what you're seeking. Set your intentions. I'm going on a quest because... Whatever the issue is, I got irritable bowel syndrome and nothing has helped heal it. Or, as in my case, I have a wrecked back and the medical profession said the only thing they know how to do is surgery. And no, I'm not letting them cut my, my spine open. And I can stand up and dance for you. I've healed it. Uh, I've gone from being, uh, being in a walker and hardly able to walk to being able to climb mountains and dance again. For real? For real. Yeah, for real. Wow. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And I had... Okay. I'll finish telling people how to incubate themselves. Okay. But first, <laughs> I'm going to tell... For real. Uh, I'm 71. When I turned 65, I was diagnosed with severe spinal stenosis. And suddenly, from full functionality, I really collapsed. And I was in monstrous pain. Uh, I deteriorated till I was uh, using canes. I was in a walker. I wasn't even in a wheelchair for six months. I was that bad. Oh, my. And I did say no to the t conventional medical practices of, um, we'll give you steroid shots in your spine. If that doesn't work, we'll give you surgery. And that's all we know how to do. And you're probably going to be crippled the rest of your life. I didn't accept that diagnosis. And I did my spiritual work urgently. So I know this tradition and practice it, but on one of the trips to Vietnam, I was on canes. I was using two canes on that trip. I had my group in the Mekong Delta, uh, and we were at we were at a a camp. We I, we I don't know. We might call it a retreat house or B and B, but it's run by a dear friend of mine who was a Viet Cong veteran. And he's got, he's built himself a, an encampment on the Mekong Delta. And he's got primitive guest houses there. And we're, so we're sleeping right on the river. And one year when I was there with this affliction and sleeping in my little, in a cot, in my little room that was built on stilts over the Mekong River, I had a dream in the middle of the night that a giant snake came out of the river, climbed up the pilings, into my room, up my cot, and then climbed on my body, and it bit me in the left thigh and sank its fangs into my left thigh. Nice. Okay. I'm pointing to it right now. I can feel the spot where the fangs went in, in the dream. Okay. All right. I woke up in incredible pain, screaming in pain from the, the snake bite, 
But then I realized, oh, this was just a dream. What happened? And from that moment for a month, I threw away my canes. I was dancing. I climbed hills again. I was dancing through the streets. It was all gone. That snake bite was exactly the the formula of an Asclepian dream. The snake was the key uh, healing animal of Asclepius. It's where we get the caduceus. He's the one who had the single staff that was snake wrapped that has become the symbol of medicine. Right. And in Asclepian dreams, either Asclepius, the god of healing, or one of his three daughters who are all healers, or one of his healing animals, usually the snake, but sometimes the dog or the rooster, uh, came to people in their dreams and visions and either healed them in the dream directly, like happened to me, or told them the prescription, the remedy for how to heal themselves. And as I said, we have a thousand or more of these um, testimonies from ancient times. And you hear I've experienced it. So, just to finish quickly, a person can incubate themselves this way. Study the tradition, drench in the arts, drench in your whatever spiritual practices you have, declare a time, a room in, uh, in your home or in a retreat center or in your chamber, uh, and pure, uh, cleanse and smudge and purify the room and declare yourself on a, a fast and a quest Get clear with your intentions and go into your chamber and just lay there and sleep and dream and wait and pray and fast for as long as it takes to get a dream or a vision. And don't you don't have to sleep all the time. The active imagination counts as well. So if you're bombarded with fantasies, just follow them and let them come. And it can happen in hours or sometimes in days. In the ancient tradition, people stayed until they received the vision. In Greece, I've incubated people for anything from just a few hours when they get their vision and they know it and they're done. Uh, the longest incubation I remember was 16 hours uh, that a person stayed in sleep getting the vision that long. Well, as I've shared, we can do this on our own. I run workshops like this by Zoom where we do the workshop in the day and then I send people home to incubate themselves overnight and the next day they come back and we share the dreams always it, something important and different and unexpected always happens that people find profoundly useful okay the important thing is to set an intention yes and that is sort of it's like a directive to your psyche to your soul yes that I would like this healing. I want to understand what's going on with me. And then to follow through with that intention by creating a space for yourself to receive the dream or the vision. And and like in my healing chamber, it's a light and sound healing chamber. I wonder if, because the sound and the light puts you into a really deep altered state very quickly. I wonder if that could really help initiate a process. For sure. Yes, the, uh, light and sound and color and smell, all of the senses were used in the ancient sanctuaries. So for sure, and I've also I've brought people who are um, holotropic breath workers to Greece. And we've done holotropic breathing for incubations. So yes, oh, any way we appeal to the senses and drench people in the senses helps and uh, intensifies the process. In the ancient Asclepia, they did they did the um, color work. They used smell. They used acupressure and massage and energy healing. They used color therapy. They chose the color that a particular afflicted person needed, and they painted floor, ceiling, and walls all in that color. So you're depressed? Well, we're putting you into a yellow chamber. Wow. Okay. So any ways that you can use your chambers to in, 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 intensify the process is good, yes. Yeah, now, I was also thinking about when I do shamanic healing sessions, that's kind of how, how it works, only I'm dreaming on behalf of someone else. But I also like to lead workshops where people are um, learning to access these realms themselves, the, the realms of their inner worlds. 
And I think it would be cool to kind of use that model to create a workshop to help people intentionally dream while they're awake and like seek that vision out. That would be fun, fun thing to do. I'm getting mm -hmm. good ideas, Ed. Good, good. <laughs> And I support your ideas and moving in that direction. As shamanic practitioners, we we do journey and dream for others. And that also happened in the Asclepian tradition. People had dreams for others. People even had collective dreams for their entire culture. Uh, really, uh, wow. when Rome was in plague, Rome sent an envoy to Epidauros to dream for the entire city to find find out how to get the city out of plague. And uh, it's a long, beautiful story, but snakes appeared and told the envoy to bring the god and the snakes back to Rome and build an escapion there to heal the whole city, which they did. And the remains of that sanctuary is still there. So we dream for others as practitioners, and we or others can can dream for others or for the collective as well. So you might, I, this is how I've pushed the practice. I facilitate dream incubation when we're in Greece, so people are dreaming for themselves, so they become their own shamanic healers and practitioners. And at the same time, I go into trance and dream for them while they're incubating. So when they come out and the next day, they present their incubation dream and we work with it. And I also present my incubation dream vision for them and we work with that and we put them together. So we've got two people traveling in the shamanic way, bringing back the visions. Very cool. You might want to push your work that far. Or maybe we can have you come out for a workshop at some point here in Vermont. Oh, I'd be honored and happy to, yeah. I'm only about three hours south of you. I'd be happy to have another excuse to drive up and work together. That'd be great. <laughs> and you can get my chamber. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I would love to have you come check it out. It's, uh, it's hey. pretty cool. One of the things I wanted to really touch base with you on today in our conversation is the importance of the language of symbolism. Because to me, I've been spending the last 20 years that I didn't realize it until like more recently that I have been learning the language of symbolism. It's the only way I can do my work. Right. And it's not the easiest process in the world. It takes some practice, but, <laughs> but maybe because we're so, we're so distant from the practice, but I think it's in us, the capacity to understand symbols is kind of inherent to who we are. But what are your thoughts on those of us who are, are maybe uh, unable to interpret the dreaming that comes through for us? Well, first I affirm with you that interpretation is difficult and accurate interpretation is really difficult. One message I got from uh, Apollo at Delphi, I was asking Apollo this, these questions. We make so many mistakes with interpretation. There's so many misinterpretations and misdiagnoses. You're the God of truth. You give oracles. How do we know how to receive you, these messages? And the answer I heard was, I give you, I are the gods. The spiritual sources give us the symbols and it's our job to interpret it. That's our human uh, contribution to the entire process. And I said, but Apollo, we usually get them wrong. And Apollo said, yeah, that's what makes interpretation the most difficult and highest art form. So go back and learn it. Heraclitus, who's famous for being the philosopher of change, who can't step into the same river twice. He also said, the God whose oracle is at Delphi neither reveals nor conceals, but gives signs. We're going to get that the sign or the symbol, and it really is our human task to interpret. So that being said, again, Carl Jung said this, and also the great American humanistic psychologist, Rollo May, said the same thing. They both said people should not study psychology first or early on in their education. We don't know enough. We're too immature. Hmm. It's esoteric wisdom after we understand how the inner world works. 
if you want to understand the inner world, drench yourself in the humanities and the arts and the spiritual studies. Learn everything you can about the world's use of symbols from ancient times and, and modern times in every culture you can and artistic symbolism. Drench yourself in that and develop the largest cachet of symbols you possibly can because that's what shows up from through the unconscious and in our dreams and our visions. That's what's going to be revealed to you. So the first thing I would say to people is that. Drench yourself in the humanities and the arts and spiritual traditions and just read and study and go to museums and do artwork and write poetry and dance and really drench yourself in it and bring the, uh, the arts and the humanities back to life in yourself. That being said, also work long and slow and hard on learning how to interpret. Don't ever reduce symptoms to the event itself that's what needs to be treated. We mistake symbols for symptoms and we try to treat the symptom to eradicate it and our medical and psychological professionals by and large think that's the problem and it's not. Yeah, to me they're, they're stories, right? They're always stories, right. Plato said, way back, Plato said, most people mistake the consequences for the causes and try then to treat the consequences if that is going to eradicate a problem. Same thing. We Symptoms are consequences of what, the, what is disturbing our soul. So if we just wipe out the consequence, uh, another symptom is going to arise in its place. Hmm. Right. We have to dig through it and understand what it's trying to express to get down to the cause. And if we get down to the cause, that's our soul's condition. And when we change that, we'll stop manufacturing symptoms. So we also even, please stop thinking in terms of diagnoses and pathologies. Uh, one of the, the concept I introduce in my book, it's not my own originally, uh, I've developed it along in collaboration with some colleagues, but we're talking about uh, learning your biomythic narrative. Hmm. What gods are and goddesses are in your disease expressing themselves through your symptomatology. Don't just wipe out the symptom. What gods and goddesses are in it? What is it trying to say to you? Just what, as you just said, Wendy, what is the story? What's the story that right. this symptom is trying to help you tell? I love it. But then the tricky part, again, is in the interpretation because your intellect is going to want to kick in and start analyzing. And that's not necessarily, to me at least, the place that you want to lean to. <laughs> to try to have that understanding it's a deeper part of you and it may not be logical does that sound yeah it it may not be logical but it will be psychological if you follow it that way yeah it'll make a, a certain type of sense to you it'll resonate or mm -hmm. uh, here's a new one that uh from last night um uh, a vietnam veteran who is now a wonderful actor and playwright and director's name is Brian Delat, D-E-L-A-T-E. He just uh, finished and, and started performing a new play that he has called Guardian Angels. It's actually on, um, what is it? Vimeo. Vimeo now, if people want to see it. So I saw the play last night. He just sent it to me from Los Angeles. It opens with an elderly veteran who has Parkinson's disease. Brian plays all the parts, it's amazing. So he's an old veteran, shaking and barely able to talk with Parkinson's. And then he tells the audience, I'm gonna tell you my story and how, how I got here. And people ask me, why don't I just die? And no, this actually is life affirming and gives me hope and I'm gonna tell you why. So then he goes back in time and he tells his story in several parts, but the most important and relevant part is he goes back into the Vietnam War and he shows us the character in combat experiencing utmost terror 
for the first time in his life. And what do you know? When you're terrified, you're shaking like you've got Parkinson's. Mm, okay. And he had to learn to hold that in and contain it in combat so he could function and not break down and be killed himself. Damn. And then when he came back from war, he's still holding it in and nobody ever treated his PTSD this way. So he held it in until he became an old man. And then we see him in the opening of the play and the end of the play. And he's saying, now you understand why I'm trembling this way. It's not a biological disease, people. It's fear. It's terror. This is what terror makes you do. And now that I know my real story, it fills me with hope because we can dig down into our soul, hearts and souls and get to the real causes of our afflictions. So choose life and choose hope no matter what. And then the play ends with this old veteran shaking like a leaf, but, but enlightened and hopeful and showing us. I have to ask Brian if he's ever actually knows any Parkinson survivors who trace, as he did in his wisdom, who trace uh, their affliction to their combat experiences. But it was a perfect demonstration. Uh, and I've had that experience with combat veterans that I've uh, worked with in their healing, that yes, they really dig down to the spiritual and emotional experience they originally had in combat that that reset their central nervous system. And much of trauma healing work now is to heal the broken brain, the nervous system, but not to go to the story that first caused it. Right. I go to the story. And when we get, get to the original story and release the emotions that are down there in that original story, then the soul heals and comes home. Yeah, super powerful. Yeah. So, Ed, are you actively working with folks these days? Do you have a practice? Yes. I mean, I, I know you're taking people um, on pilgrimages and such, but are you taking on new clients these days to help them? Mm -hmm. I do have an ongoing practice that um, when I'm overseas, well, I will stay in touch with people if they need me, of course, but mostly I, I do close my practice for three or four weeks at a time. Uh, to do these journeys. But when I'm stateside, which is most of the time, I have an active practice, yes. Okay. And are you working with folks just in Massachusetts where you live or all over the place, from all over the place? Uh, no, I'm actually working with folks all over the world. Okay. I'm literally, uh, because of also my other specialty in healing war trauma, I'm presently working by Zoom with people on the front lines in Ukraine. Oh, wow. And I'm working by Zoom with some psychologists in Moscow who are against the war, but have decided to stay in the country to try to help their country heal from such massive trauma. Uh, and it's really, really bad there, my friends and colleagues tell me. I can't imagine. It's like yeah. the 1950s. It's like the 1940s or 50s here during our wars, just ignoring the veterans' plights, warehousing them in hospitals, massive medications to turn them into zombies, and not letting anybody tell their stories. So it's really bad. And they don't know how to treat war trauma. So as behind the need as we are in this country, they're decades behind us. So to be working with them actually during the war while it's happening and trying to reduce trauma is very difficult, but it's a great honor and privilege to be doing the work. Yeah, I can't imagine. So I really do work all over the world. A busy fellow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doing very good work. Yeah, thank you. How do folks get a hold of you if they wanted to learn more about your work and your sure. books? Sure, thank you. I have I have two websites. Uh, all my work and lots of uh, podcasts, so I'll put hours on, and some of my articles and information on my journeys and such is on my website called Mentor the Soul, mentorthesoul.com. Sorry, dot com's all used up. Mentorthesoul.guide. Oh, okay. Okay, that's one website. And then for my books, uh, my uh, I have an author's website as well, which is just edwardtick.com. So people can get to me through either one, or my email address is simply dredtick, D-R-E-D-T-I-C-K, at Gmail. Okay. Well, I 
thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much for coming on. You're very welcome, Wendy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the work you do. Both of us and, and all of our friends out there, thank you for helping bring true spirituality and soulfulness back into our suffering world. That's what we all need to be doing. Wouldn't it be cool if dreaming was woven back into our daily experience? That we started each day chatting with friends or family about the adventures we had the night before? Or that the first thing we do when we're feeling stuck or ill is to request a dream? Well, if you'd like to deepen your relationship with your dreaming, please check out Ed's websites, edwardtick.com and mentorthesoul.guide. And thank you so much for listening. I hope you have an incredible rest of your day and very sweet dreams. Until next time.